I borrow this from Michael Sandel. He's a professor at Harvard University. He has a class that he teaches there called Justice. At any given time at Harvard, the class can have upwards of a thousand students in it. A thousand students. The interesting thing is, is he teaches the class in what's called the, the Socratic method. So he gives a scenario and then there are microphones that are placed throughout and he asks students to basically give feedback or their thoughts about, um, uh, uh, well basically about the scenario that he, that he le gives them. You can read his book, Justice, uh, or if you just went on to YouTube, you can actually watch the class. And so it's Michael Sandel, S-A-N-D-E-L, um, and it's called Justice. So I'm borrowing this from his book. In the summer of 1884, four English sailors, by the way, we dealt with English sailors the first week, right? And when I got that far, I was like, what, what's up with English sailors? <laughs> Four English sailors were stranded at sea in a small lifeboat in the South Atlantic over a thousand miles from land. Their ship, the Mignonette, had gone down in a storm. They had escaped to the lifeboat with only two cans of preserved turnips and no fresh water. Thomas Dudley was the captain, Edwin Stevens was the first mate, and Edmund Brooks was a sailor, quote, all men of excellent character according to the newspaper accounts. The fourth member of the crew was the cabin boy, Richard Parker, age 17. He was an orphan on his first voy uh, long voyage at sea. He had signed up against the advice of his friends, quote, in the hopefulness of youthful ambition, thinking the journey would make a man of him. Sadly, Michael Sandel went on to say, it would not be. From the lifeboat, the four stranded sailors watched the horizon, hoping a ship might pass and rescue them. For, three, for the first three days, they ate small rations of turnips. On the fourth day, they caught a turtle. They subsisted on the turtle and the remaining turnips for the next few days, and then for eight days, they ate nothing. By now, Par by now Parker, the cabin boy, was lying in the corner of the lifeboat. He had drunk seawater against the advice of the others, and he had become ill. He appeared to be dying. On the 19th day of their ordeal, Dudley, the captain, suggested drawing lots to determine who would die so that others might live. But Brooks refused, and no lots were drawn. The next day came, and still no help was in sight. Hmm. Dudley told Brooks <laughs> to avert his gaze and motioned to Stevens that Parker had to be killed. Dudley offered a prayer, told the boy his time had come, and then killed him with a penknife, stabbing him in the jugular vein. Brooks emerged from his conscientious objection. <laughs> I never make it past that without giggling a little bit. I mean, how big's the boat, right? But Brooks emerged from his conscientious objection to share in the gruesome bounty. For four days, the three men fed on the body of the cabin boy. And then help came. Dudley describes their rescue in his diary with staggering euphemism. On the 24th day, as we were having our breakfast, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just reading, this is real. A ship appeared at last. The three survivors were picked up. Upon their return to England, they were arrested and tried. Brooks turned to state's witness. Dudley and Stevens went to trial. They freely confessed that they had killed and eaten Parker. They claimed that they had done so out of necessity. Now suppose that you are the judge. How would you rule? And to simplify things, put aside the question of law and assume that you are asked to decide whether killing the cabin boy was morally permissible. I open the floor up to you. No, stop. I, I, I can't keep all this together here. Not, not morally permissible? Okay. Anybody want to go for it? Similar circumstances, if they had all agreed to draw lots, it would have been. 
Okay, so if you just changed it a little bit and said had they all drawn lots and poor Parker, you know, it's like, oh, that would be different. Okay, Grace? Okay. Right. Well, I mean, the, the options were limited. <laughs> right. So, so, so far, because it's like Grace was saying, it seems that they just assumed that their lives were more important than Parker's. Right? Okay. No, but nobody, nobody think? So, the life of pi was based on? Oh, I don't have any idea. Life of pi? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. So, okay, uh, which, so I, it depends, I think, a little bit on realistically, were they aware of how close to death he was? Mm -hmm. Because had he died, I, I don't know if the flesh would have become immediately non consumable. But if, you, if he was really that close to death, I think it changes a little bit. All right, so. We have somebody here that's not inherently opposed to cannibalism. It's a, it's a good start. <laughs> okay? We're not really talking about cannibalism. We're talking about murder. Okay. We just say, well, I mean, cannibalism is what they did. They ate him. But, he, but, they, but definitely, they definitely took his life, right? I, I, I would be morally opposed to cannibalism for survival in a, if the body had died naturally. Okay. So if the body dies naturally... Which I think is kind of where you were getting at it. You're, you're like, hey, you know, he's already sick. You know, if he dies, then you go, oh, well, you know, now we have a means of, of survival. Something like that. Yeah, so be, why, did, why did they not wait for him to die before they... Okay. It, it sounds like a strange situation, doesn't it? The, the, the catch is, is it was real. It happened. So it's not just a matter of pure fiction. The strongest argument for the defense is probably what you would expect it to be. Given the dire circumstances, and those circumstances were dire, but given the dire circumstances, it was necessary to kill one person in order to save three. Right? I mean, you can, you can kind of intuitively see that. That's the reasoning. I'm not asking you to agree with it. That's, that's just the reasoning. Had, had no one been killed and eaten, all four very likely would have died. Um, they're looking at poor Parker. He was already very sick. They were seeing that he was pretty much at the end of his life anyway, which made him, at least to them, the best candidate, um, whereas the others were doing relatively well. Um, remember, Parker is the one that, in spite of being told not to drink seawater, chugged it. So there you go. So he's weakened and ill, and so they found him to be the logical candidate. Um, and unlike Dudley and Stevens, he had no dependents. Remember? He doesn't have any dependents. The others do. I'm just showing you a way of thinking. And I ask you to agree with it. Do you get it yet? Like, do you get it? That's kind of the idea. He has no dependents. And so his death, it certainly deprived him of his life, but he was probably going to be deprived of that anyway. He had no one to support. He did not leave a grieving wife or any grieving children. And so some would argue that makes a moral difference in the situation. Now, you could kind of turn and say, no, I guess just everybody has to die. All four have to die. You can go that route, but it's not the route that a utilitarian would go. Uh, if I were to kind of cast this in a broad strokes, and I'll unpack utilitarianism here um, in a little bit for you, but the big idea with utilitarianism as an ethical theory is we are morally obligated to do what benefits the most. You do the greatest good for the greatest number. And we have a moral obligation to do that. And it's not, it's honestly, it's not just an ethical theory, it's a theory of justice as well. I mean, it's intimately tied together. Now, I, I want to point a couple of things out on the front end with our cannibalism story that I threw you into right off the bat. 
Some of you, I think, decided not to eat poor Parker because you're just not going to eat people, <laughs> right? And that's fair. But I want to point out a couple of things, at least two objections. Um, it, it can be asked whether the benefits of killing the cabin boy taken as a whole really did outweigh the cost. So if the idea of utilitarianism is to do what is the best for the most, mm, even counting the number of lives saved and the happiness of the survivors and their families allowing such a killing might have bad consequences for society as a whole. That's a possibility. Make some sense? That's one. Here's another. Even if all things considered, the benefits do outweigh the costs, and I think this is where most of you are getting. We kind of have this nagging sense that killing and eating a defenseless cabin boy is wrong. And for reasons that go beyond the calculation of social costs, right? It's just wrong. Now, I bring that, that up because what it does is it pulls out some ethical intuitions from you, right? So what it seems like y'all were not willing to do is to lean into kind of what a utilitarian would want you to lean, lean into. Hey, look, it's a horrible situation. Uh, we need to get some good out of this. And the good that we get out of this is three people are saved. Even if the circumstance is regrettable, at least three people are saved. Now, to anybody that is appalled by the actions of Dudley and Stevens, which is, I think, all of you, from what I could tell, the first objection is going to seem more like a complaint to a utilitarian. Uh, it accepts the utilitarian assumption that morality is in weighing costs and benefits and simply wants a fuller reckoning of the social consequences. We're just going to have to accept it. You know, sometimes when you're making decisions, people get left out. There, there is no ideal. There is no perfect. And so a number of utilitarians will say, and we're willing to accept it. We, we would love for the situation to be different. It's not different. So how do you get the, how do you minimize the pain? even though there's pain. They're not saying there was no pain there, but you're maximizing good. That's the way a utilitarian would want you to kind of process this situation. And then the second objection is more to the point. It rejects the idea, when, if you're utilitarian, that the right thing to do is simply a matter, of, or if you are a utilitarian, is just a matter of calculating consequences, namely the costs and the benefits. One of, the, one of the purported advantages of utilitarianism is that there's, it, there's a kind of a mathematical nature to it, right? Uh, and you've probably actually reasoned like this before if you're going to be honest with me. If you've ever had the thought, something like this, I think we're just going to do the best for the most, then you were thinking more like a utilitarian than you were with these guys that were stuck in a boat and dying. Have you ever been there before and said something like that? Maybe the circumstances, you weren't eating people. The circumstances were maybe just a little bit different, right? So you see a couple of different ways of kind of processing a similar situation. On the one hand, the way it seems that a lot of you were looking at it was, no, you, you certainly don't take his life. That's not morally permissible. Um, but what that would mean is, is that you would lean away from utilitarianism as a viable ethical theory. Make some sense? Let me give you a different one. Can I ask a question? Yeah. In your experience or experience teaching this, are utilitarians fine with that until they're Parker? Are they fine with that until they're Parker? <laughs> You're not looking good over there, guy. No, I feel great. <laughs> um, I, I don't, let, me, let, me, let me point this one out. I don't know if this is, this is true. It, 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 is sto it is said to be true that Peter Singer, who I brought up before, you know, Peter Singer, the ethicist, considered one of the most controversial ethicists of, of like at least the last hundred years. He's the guy that had no problem saying life in the womb has, has no intrinsic value to it, and it's not a human person. It's, a, it's biologically a human, but it's not a human person. You remember me talking about that? That's Peter Singer. And so even after the child is born and it's outside of the womb, well, it's, it doesn't have any like higher capacities just because it was born. And so it doesn't have any intrinsic rights simply because it was born, right? Peter Singer. It is said, and, I, and I'm admitting, I'm not sure if it's true, but it is said that um, later, when his mom was later in life, dealing with dementia and whatnot, 
because Peter Singer is also the same guy that had no problem with geriatricide, which is uh, basically killing old people. And the big picture idea that he had in mind for it was um, these folks are kind of a drain on our resources. And through a utilitarian calculus, you know, you're saving beds, you're saving money. These, these people are old. They've had their life. This, this was him. Um, and so we don't need to be using livers and kidneys and lungs and all of this stuff. We need to be saving those for people that are younger, that have the capacity to make and continue to make a contribution to the good of society. And so, so to speak, maybe we even have a moral obligation for geriatricide. But it's said that Singer couldn't do it with his mother. We'll get to that here in a little bit, but your point is fair. Your point is absolutely fair. I think a true utilitarian person would be okay, even if he was Parker. Well, even if he was Parker, yeah. So I'll unpack this here in a little bit, but you, but you, had, a, you had a great question. Let me give you a second scenario. Um, a similar question comes up in contemporary debates about whether torture is ever justified in the interrogation of suspected terrorists. This came up, well, well relatively recently, and especially post 9-11. Uh, uh, there was the question around whether or not waterboarding was something that we should be doing, which is simulated drowning is what it is. But it gets people to a literal breaking point, right? Is, is torture, and that's only one example of torture. There are other kinds of torture. I'm not talking about tickle torture, though. We're talking about the real thing, right? So, the ar but the argument actually begins with a utilitarian calculation. T you know, torture inflicts pain on the suspect, greatly reducing his happiness and utility. However, if what was going on is, is that you knew that there was, it's the famous ticking time bomb scenario, if you had them in your custody and you even thought they were the one that had planted the bomb, then maybe you torture them so that you can save the lives of other people. Now, in this situation, how many of you are okay with torturing the suspected terrorist so that you can get the information that is needed so that you can find the ticking time bomb? Do I have any takers? I'm going to give you another second here. <laughs> Do I have any takers? Can I see the hands? Okay, okay, Ryan, thank you. Appreciate your honesty. Thank you. Can I ask a question? And you know what it's going to be. What's the difference? Okay, so you're going to say one is murder and one is not. So torture, you're not, you're not literally killing the person. You're, you're just inflicting a lot of pain on them. So it's not inherently wrong to inflict pain on somebody. Not a terrorist. Uh, not a terrorist. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. <laughs> okay. Well, waterboarding is definitely, that was one of the examples that I, that I gave for sure. There are definitely other forms of torture. Unless we use other forms of torture. <laughs> I only gave one example, <laughs> right? But, if the, but the, the question I'm getting at is, you know, Brian is saying, no, there's a difference here because, you know, poor Parker, you know, passes away in the first example. Here, you're just torturing somebody so that you can save other lives, but you're not taking a life to do it. And so you would see a morally, you would see something morally different there. Well, the terrorist is, you're going to say, well, presumed guilty. He hasn't been before a tribunal or anything, right? You're trying to get the ticking time bomb, right? Okay, so you would say that there's a factual difference. Being stranded in the ocean is different than in a time where you have an engaged conflict, like post 9 11, for example. Josh, did you have your hand up? I disagree with both because I don't think we look at the cost, the cost of the person doing the torturing and the cost of the person eating the other person. You know, we're, we're assuming that this is a, a greater good for whatever the, the scenario is, however mm -hmm. we justify it. But when you take that step, there's a cost to the individual involved in it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the benefits that we see outweigh what that cost ends up meaning later on. Okay. Yeah. All right. I would argue that if you're in that position, you've made the determination to that you're willing to bear that cost. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. I think somebody over here had their hand up. Maybe not. Yes. Mr. Dwight, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you know, if you weren't here, one of the questions in uh, a time of war is, is anybody actually an innocent? Right? So if, if, the, if the United States, had, think of World War II, and you know, you're talking about the bombing of civilians, that always comes up in a time of war. Um, is that morally justifiable? Well, part of that hinges on whether or not anybody's actually an innocent. Or in a war, did you give that up? Did you just say, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? I was just going to say, in Hosea, God had him cut the babies out of the womb, you know, as part of the, the annihilation of the cereal. Mm -hmm. Hosea, so does that justifiable? Because God did it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ms. Grace? Than these situations? Yeah. You know, the difference is I'm giving you real situations. <laughs> All right? I mean, you would, again, you would love for the world to be different. It's just not. And yet you have to make decisions, which is why I've always said, you know, don't act like you know what you would do if you're the president of the United States unless you have sat in the chair. Mm -hmm. right? that, that is tremendous pressure, right? Which is why I pray. I don't care who it is. I just pray God gives them tremendous wisdom for, for what it is that they have to deal with. Yeah. So how does it apply if we're the ones doing the torture versus somebody else doing it? Yeah, so just like a member of the military or something like that. You having to do it. Well, so let me give you an example. So this goes back to how it was like the 1950s. Uh, Philippa Foote was a professor of philosophy, and she came up with what's called the famous trolley problem. You know, you find a trolley that's barreling toward five people. Now, you're standing next to a lever. And all you have to do is to pull the lever, and it will throw the switch on the track, and it will divert the trolley. Now, however, when it diverts the trolley, it's going to kill one person to the right. See the trolley problem? This, this makes you the one, so I'm just building on you. It's not, hey, this isn't a, a trained person in the military that's trained in torture tactics. It's you having to do it. Does it change it? Well, the trolley problem gets you directly involved with it. There's, there's kind of no way to, your hands can't be clean here so to speak, right? Um, how many of you would pull the lever, by the way? Pull the lever and you run over one person. If you leave it alone, the trolley goes and, and barrels over five people. Thank you, Jimmy Roth. Let me give you something that was said to me. I know, Jimmy over here. So I was teaching, when I was doing a, an, an ethics class called Contemporary Moral Issues at A&M, the trolley problem came up, and where they were trying to understand ba the basic tenets of utilitarianism, right? <laughs> Student raises his hand. Well, who are the five and who's the one? I'm like, <laughs> this guy over here, right? There's always one in the crowd, you know? And I said, well, does it matter? Does it matter? I mean, it, because what a utilitarian would probably argue is, I mean, it's unfortunate that one is going to die, but you're saving five. See, all of a sudden, you know, yeah, all of a sudden. Well, what about the World Trade Center? Would you have, if you could have waterboarded somebody to detect that plan and... Yeah, waterboarding to stop 9-11, for example, and the thousands of people that died. How many of you guys would be okay with waterboarding in that? Would it be the same, the same group? Because, again, I think some of you are saying, nobody's dying here. It's, it's painful. It's painful, but... We're, you know, we're, we're saving lives. And then it turns out it wasn't the terrorist. You had the wrong person. All right, I was just being fun there. You know, the reason that... <laughs> the reason that... Uh, so the student at A&M brings, brings up and goes, well, who's the five over here? Who's the one over here? I said, why does it matter? And he goes, well, I'm a Christian. And if it's Jesus to the right, he's going to rise in three days. <laughs> That's what he said. I was like... Said you're pulling the lever on your Lord and Savior. <laughs> oh my gosh, man! 
I, I want to be clear. I want to be clear about something, and then we'll we'll do some unpacking here. Uh, this, I, I don't want you to necessarily think that utilitarians are going to favor torture. I'm, I'm trying to see what you think they would do. Some utilitarians actually oppose torture on practical grounds. Here, here's why. They argue that it, it seldom works. It's just practical. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Um, since information extracted under duress, and this, the studies have shown this, is often very unreliable. They'll say anything to get you to stop, right? Yeah, oh, okay, okay, it's in New York. It's on Fifth Avenue. And you're like, okay, and then out you go, and it's not there, right? It's, it's typically unreliable. They just want the pain to stop. And what that means is the community isn't made any safer. So on purely practical grounds, maybe torture is not the way to go, right? So just because you're a utilitarian doesn't mean you have to go that way. Here's the second thing. Uh, they worry that if our country engages in torture, you know where this is going, then our soldiers will face a harsher treatment if they're taken prisoner. When you are dealing with utilitarianism, you have to, so I kind of loaded you a little bit, but you have to think about every possible person that could be impacted by the decision that you're making. Does that make sense? And, and depending on who you're, which utilitarian you're talking about, that includes future generations. What is this decision going to do, not just for us, but for future generations? So um, maybe they'd go, no, we're not going to do this because we, don't, we wouldn't want this done to our soul. A harsher judgment is going to come down on them, purely for practical reasons. Um, now, that being said, utilitarians would not say, I think in agreement with a lot of you people, that torturing a human being is intrinsically wrong. They wouldn't say that because there might be grounds that are morally sufficient where you torture for the greater good, right? You just have to figure out and kind of prove that it actually is for the greater good. All right, does that make some sense? Now, I'm gonna give you one last example. Uh, this goes back to the 1970s, and I always have to wonder about what you people were doing back in the 1970s. It was the, during the 70s, the Ford Pinto. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, getting those hands up, woo! Did anybody own a Ford Pinto? We have them here. Dean Fullerton. Quit it. <laughs> and you want one now, don't you? And you're alive to talk about it. Well, we're going to get there, Dean. Here's the thing. The Ford Pinto was one of the best-selling sub, uh, uh, subcompact cars in the United States. However, there was a problem. And you might know what it was. Its fuel tank was prone to explode when another car collided with it from the rear. Th did y'all know this? Yeah. Yep. Okay. More than, just so you know, more than 500 people died when their Pintos burst into flames. And I'm not going to lie, when I read this, I made bean jokes. <laughs> their <laughs> Pintos burst into flames. Okay. More than 500 people died when their Pintos burst into flames. And many more suffered severe burn injuries. When one of the burn victims sued Ford Motor Company for the faulty design, it emerged that Ford engineers had been aware of the danger posed by the gas tank. They knew. They knew. But company executives had conducted a cost-benefit analysis and determined that the benefits of fixing it in lives saved and injuries prevented, that's the benefit, were not worth the $11 per car it would have cost to equip each car with a device that would have made the gas tank safer. I'm not done. <laughs> to calculate the benefits to be gained by a safer gas tank, Ford estimated that 180 deaths and 180 burn injuries would result <clears throat> if no changes were made. It then placed a monetary value on each life lost and injury suffered. $200,000 per life, 70s, 70s, 1970s, and $67,000 per injury. It added to these amounts the number and value of the Pintos likely to go up in flames and calculated that the overall benefit of the safety improvements would be $49.5 million dollars but the cost of adding an $11 device to 12.5 million vehicles would be $137.5 million. So the company concluded 
that the cost of fixing the fuel tank was not worth the benefits of a safer car. You kind of see how they got there. Upon learning of the study, the jury was outraged. Anybody stunned out there? It awarded the plaintiff two and a half million dollars in compensatory damages and wait for it, $125 million in punitive damages, which was later reduced to three and a half million. I'm like, how'd that happen? But whatever. Um, now, perhaps the jurors considered it wrong for a corporation to assign a monetary value to human life, or perhaps they thought that $200,000 was low. Ford had not come up with that figure on its own, but where did they get it from? They had taken it from a U.S. government agency. That's where they got it. In the early 1970s, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which is a thing, had calculated the cost of a traffic fatality, counting future pro productivity losses, medical costs, funeral costs, and the victim's pain and suffering. The agency arrived at $200,000 per fatality. So if the jury's objection was to the price tag, not the principal, you see what I'm saying? If it's the price tag and not the principal, a utilitarian could agree. It's not about the principal. It was just about the money. Few people would choose to die in a car crash for $200,000. Uh, most people like living, it turns out. And so to measure the full effect on the utility of a traffic fatality, one would have to include the victim's loss of future happiness, not only loss of earnings and funeral costs as well. But I give that example as kind of a final example um, for you to see. It was a purely utilitarian calculus in the 1970s by the Ford Motor Company, right? That's how they got there. Now, the reason that I give you this theory is because when you get into, for example, like departments of philosophy, you're going to run into this one a lot more. You know, last week we talked about relativism. And I showed you that's, you don't really find that in departments of philosophy. You kind of have to go over to like sociology. Um, but this, this actually has a lot more sway in departments of philosophy. One of the reasons is it doesn't actually require God to ground it. Make sense? It doesn't. Um, and so that's a perceived benefit. You have an, a, a purely naturalistic theory of ethics. The second thing that you can, you can uh, a second benefit, sorry, is the one that I mentioned before. It's a little bit more precise. Have you noticed that some of the, the situations that we get into, they're kind of messy. But it seems to be a little bit more precise because you actually have a cost and benefit that you can sit there and you can weigh things out on how you're going to make a decision. And many of you, if you've ever like, owned a business or run a business, you kind of do this. Well, a little bit, <laughs> right? You do. You talk about what are the costs, what are the benefits. We, so we naturally reason like this. The execs didn't buy their mother's pentos. That's probably fair, right? The concept itself makes some logical sense. Yeah. As long as you're not bringing in the moral aspect of the decision. Well, but that's the thing. You said it, it, it makes some sense as long as you don't bring in the moral aspect of the decision making. But they would say this is the decision making. This is the moral aspect of the decision making. And, they, and, they, and it doesn't bother them. As a rule of thumb, it doesn't really bother them. You know, they, they just say, hey, hey, look, we have to accept some things that there's some drawbacks to our, our, our theory, and sometimes people get left out. They'll, they'll just go ahead and accept it. But I'm saying I think in some cases even a moral person could use the concept to make the <clears throat> Well, as long do as you, not would, would you agree that there are some times where you need to be thinking about what, the, what results are going to happen to the decision that you make? And we all say yes. So that's why I'm saying, look, you, none of you have probably ever said, we just need to take this and categorically cast it out. But that's different than saying that this is all that morality is. You see the difference between the two? It can be a factor in the way that you deliberate, but that's a huge difference from saying this is all that morality is. Let me unpack a couple of things for you that, that I think might be, might be helpful, or, or hopefully it's helpful. Um, when it comes to utilitarianism, um, you need to make a distinction because we were getting at it earlier between intrinsic goods and instrumental goods. In, in what are called intrinsic goods and things that are called instrumental goods. So an intrinsic good, these are things that are good for their own sake. It's just good for their own sake. Whereas instrumental goods are good because of what they lead to. 
They're instrumentally valuable. They're instrumentally useful. We call them good not because they're desirable for their own sake, because they're not, but rather because they make it easier for, for us to get things that are desirable. You see the difference between the two? So some, for example, would look at knowledge and say that knowledge is intrinsically valuable to have. It's not just valuable because of what could result from it. It's just better to be knowledgeable than not. Make sense? Uh, however, there are some other goods, like some would point out money. Money might be considered more instrumentally good. Um, it's, it's not just plain, uh, this is East Texas me coming out. It ain't just plain good. <laughs> that would be instrumentally, that would be intrinsically good. Uh, but it's, it's good because it's useful for some things. Um, it's valuable because it, it's a means to ob obtaining other good things. But it's not desirable just on its own. You see the difference between the two? One of the things that a utilitarian might point out to say is intrinsically valuable is happiness. It's just better to be happy than not. Right? Have you noticed that that's kind of way the cost-benefit analyses have been going? How do we maximize what? Happiness and good. How do we minimize what? Pain and suffering. They connect it to that. That's where they're coming from. And by the way, anytime you're like, hey, I don't want to be in pain, eh, you're agreeing with them somewhat. And that's, perfect. that's perfectly fine. But this is also why this is sometimes called a hedonistic theory of ethics. And, that, and it's not meant in a bad way, like, oh, you hedonist. You know, it just means that happiness or pleasure is the only thing that is in, intrinsically good and everything else is just instrumentally good for us to have that. Like money can actually buy you some things that make you happy, right? That would be an example. There's nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with saying that, but that's where they, they come up with it. The second thing that you need to remember is this. This is inherently what is called consequentialist. The, the phrase that you might wanna keep in mind for utilitarianism for as popular of a theory it is, and it's very popular, the ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. Once you can obtain what is going to maximize the good and diminish pain and suffering, you have a moral obligation then to do it because this is what morality consists in. So the ends justify the means. You were kind of seeing that, right? So how do they do it? First, they would say you need to, when you're in a situation, you need to identify your options. What are my, what are my possibilities here in terms of my decisions that I can make? Identify your options. Second is you calculate the overall balance of happiness for each option. Torture. You do a cost-benefit analysis. And once that cranks through, like Rex Wolf's math class, you know what moral obligation you have to do, even if there's going to be pain and suffering involved. You know what you have to do, right? Third, you need to ensure that the calculations account for everyone that is affected. You account for everybody affected. Now, you, you can see right off the bat what concerns might be a part of a theory like this. One is you're asking for, you're asking a person to know some things that they don't know. Who, who all is affected by this decision that I'm making right now? Who are all the people you don't know <laughs> that could be affected by this decision that you're making right now? Right? Uh, that's one of the problems. That's a great point to bring up. You don't know what you don't know. And so you make this decision, you go, oh, dang, that was horrible. <laughs> I ruined everything, right? That's, a, that's a, 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 realistic, a realistic objection to this. Not only is it just who are the people that I, I can't factor into how this is going to affect them, but I may not even know all the possibilities here and how each choice that we're looking at would affect each person. I mean, some of you would look at it and go, hey, good, I'm on the, I'm on the winning side, so... You know, it's good with me, but boy, it would stink to be them, right? So that, that's one of the ones that always come up. Here's another thing. You remember when I said this theory is, it, it, it ebbs and flows. You have different ways of defending it. However, one of the common themes is, is kind of maximizing happiness or pleasure, depending on how they want to do it, 
minimizing pain and, and suffering. And one of the things behind it was is happiness is intrinsically good. Do you remember me saying that? You'll find this, for example, in, in Peter Singer. Well, there's a guy that at Harvard um, some years ago, this goes back to like the 1970s, and um, I was actually doing a series of lectures. This was two Januaries ago. I was at Oklahoma Baptist University, and I was doing what's called the Worldview Lectures for the students up there. And um, the, the, the idea behind it is, is you, uh, for, of the series is how your worldview shapes literally everything. It shapes the way that you see everything, and it's because it does. So the topic that I decided to jump into so was, so what really makes for the good life? What really makes for the good life? And I brought this scenario up to the students at Oklahoma Baptist University. It's borrowed from a guy named Robert Nozick, who uh, was a professor at Harvard back in the 70s and 80s. This, I think, was from 1974, if I remember right. And he said, I want you to imagine what we'll call the experience machine. And the experience machine, once you attach to it, every experience that you have will be a pleasurable one. It's a guarantee. Every single experience that you have will be a pleasurable one. Now, of course, what you're attaching yourself to is a simulated reality, right? It's not real. Now, once you make the decision to go into the experience machine, you can't come out. You're just making the choice. I'm either going into the experience machine or I'm not. Are you tracking Nozick so far? The other option that you have is to not go into the experience machine. Now, what that means is, is you, you're choosing to stay in reality. And in the 70s, artificial intelligence, you know, we're not where we are, right? You're choosing to stay in reality with, ev with everything that reality is. And what, what you know that that means is, is that there are going to be days where it's, it's, it's really great. You're going to have great days. And then you're going to have other days that are, that are just awful. So the question becomes, who would go into the experience machine? And I'm actually asking you that question. And then I'll tell you what the students at Oklahoma Baptist University said. Do I have anybody that's going to take, take me up on it? Well, it's not me. It's not it's Robert Nozick. Who's going to take him up on it? Well. He's, so, because the whole, so it's a thought experiment, but the basic idea is, is once you plug into the experience machine, every experience that you will have will be pleasurable. It's, it's not real. It's not real. It's not what the experience machine is going to give you. You got to go with it. Is anybody in here going to go into the experience machine? Wally. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah. And is anybody going in? I don't, I don't have anybody here going into the experience. Listen. No, I said, Uncle Don. Here, okay. What I said was, once you make the choice to go in, you're in. Right? Can't go in and out, Uncle Don. Good grief. Anybody going in? And once you go in, you're in. Okay. Can I ask this? Because it seems like nobody's going in. <laughs> Why not? Why not? All right, go for it. It's the difference between a bunch of people who've lived life and realize what that is and a bunch of kids who haven't lived life yet. I'm sure they said, someone said, yeah, sure, because... No, you hold on. Hold on. I'm just saying. I was asking you. <laughs> I'll tell you what the good students at Oklahoma Baptist University said. I know, it's my daughter, so I know what yeah. they said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I paid for what they said. <laughs> Would you, you're, you're not going in. No, no, I just think that's why nobody here is. We, have, we haven't experienced it. So I wouldn't, I want, I like the pain. Okay. I see the pain. You like the pain. All right. Anybody else want to go for it? I think I see a hand over here. Yeah. If you only experience pleasure, then you end up with nothing, except pleasure. I, is your hand up? At, is, Victoria, is that you in the back?
Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so in spite of the pain and suffering that you've had, the pain and suffering is what has shaped you the most. Mm -hmm. And so it's worth it. Not that you enjoy pain and suffering, but it had a purpose. Okay. You became a different person as a result. Josh, your hand up. You do thought experiments, and this is what happens. If there's no heaven, Josh is going in the experience machine. All right. Anyway, go ahead, Jimmy. If, if I were to go in and every experience is pleasurable, then that would therefore count negative experiences like committing a crime would be pleasurable. So then what differentiates me from somebody who commits a crime in reality and finds pleasure in doing it? Okay, so then, so you were just pointing out if it's making every experience pleasurable, then it could even make criminal activity right. pleasurable, yeah. right? That out okay. Window, which is not something I would want to give up. Yeah. I mean, the closest thing I can come to that I have done, thinking about what you're saying, is, is uh, you know, I, I play some video games, and there's games now that you can mod and do things where right. you can basically become godlike. Mm -hmm. And you can't die, everything turns out great, you kill everybody, you do whatever you're supposed to do, you find all the treasures. Eventually you get bored. Eventually you get it's bored? Just, it's bored. There's no risk. There's no reward. All right. You know, it's like, no risk, yeah, no reward? I know I'm going to find the treasure. I know I'm going to, you know, I'm going to wipe out okay. the bad guys. And you're just like, it's okay. All right. All right. We'll get, let's get a couple more, and then I'll kind of land this plane. Plumber, what are you going to say? Uh, we're not perfected yet. So no, we're not. We're human beings, flawed. We Correct. We cannot enjoy just pleasure because that would be suffering. I don't think that we are made to just in our flesh, enjoy our pleasure because we cannot even value it. We cannot even appreciate it. That's meaningless. Mm -hmm. and it's like Solomon. He had women. He had this. Everything that he could have under the sun. Solomon had everything. Meaningless, meaningless. Yeah. So. And he looked at it and was like, I gave up a lot to have this and it wasn't worth it. Right? Grace? My prime example is bearing a child. That's not mm. pleasurable. But how many moms would keep that up? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Miss Denise? The pleasure machine was created by man. The life you have was created by God. I choose the life created by God over the life created by man. Okay. If you want to know what the good students at Oklahoma Baptist University thought, <laughs> <clears throat> none of them were going into the experience machine. Yeah, none, none did. But if you ask them why, the answer was, I would rather have a life that is real than one that is simulated, even if the real life has kind of the peaks and the valleys. You know, if it's going to have pain and suffering, I'll take the pain and suffering because it's real versus a simulated experience. Now, you may go, why are you bringing that up? And the answer is, I just wanted to. <laughs> now, here, so here's why I'm bringing it up. So utilitarianism usually argues that the thing that is intrinsically good is what? Happiness or pleasure, de depending on who's unpacking the theory. But then you get to the experience machine and guess what you see? We don't really buy that. We don't buy that. I can guarantee you pleasure and happiness. I'll pass. Did you catch that? Every time I have gone and talked about the experience machine at universities and those kinds of things, I have not had anybody really wanting to go. There was one guy at OBU that finally stood up and he goes, I mean, if nobody will go, I might. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but what was your gut? And he goes, yeah, I wasn't going, but nobody else was going, so I was like, I'll go. I was like, All right. I was like, sit down. <laughs> That's not what I was asking. If this is what is intrinsically good, you see it? Our intuitions tell us we don't even believe that. And that's what the experience machine, when Robert knows it, kind of formulated, like I said, around 1974, that was what he was pointing out. We have this intuition there's more to this. There's more of what we value than just pleasure and happiness. And as a result, what that means is, is that it, it can't just be what ethics is. Make sense? I mean, if that's what's foundational to the theory, then... It can't be just, even if we deliberate about consequences is what, there's got to be more to morality than this. Um, and then the other thing, kind of this is where we'll end for tonight, is, is people, people typically have a problem with the ends justify the means. Because you can go off the rails 
with an idea like that, right? So a doctor is caring for four dying patients, all of them in need of organ transplants. Two need kidneys, one needs a heart, one needs a liver, respectively. And then a healthy patient comes in for a routine checkup, and good news, he's healthy. Everything's just right. He's got all the parts. Now, if you want to <laughs> walk in and say, good news, <laughs> you're going to die. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Now, to, to be fair, I think a utilitarian would push back, right? And, and I think the pushback would be something like this. Um, utility would not be maximized in these cases, in, in a case like that. And, and the reason why would be, if anybody ever got word that this is what happens when you go to the doctor, it would be the total collapse of the medical industry, <laughs> right? So, no, may, maybe not that. However, others have come up with scenarios where mm, it seems like you could do what on the face of it is, is morally atrocious and yet be justified in doing it. And some of you are even getting there with some of the examples that I gave you before, right? You get the idea? So, there you go. A final thought. I said the final thought. I had one final thought. This is the final thought. You remember before when I was talking about students, I was like, so you have the trolley problem. Five this way, you have one that way, you have a lever in front of you. What are you going to do? Well, um, and the student's like, well, who's the one over there? Because if it's Jesus, you know, okay, fine. But one of the pushbacks on this theory is that it requires strict impartiality. You're just one of a number. As a matter of fact, everybody is just one of a number, right? And so if the most important person in your life, and you can pick somebody, it can be your kids, it can be your spouse, it can be your best friend, your mother, your daddy, I don't care, pick them. They're trapped in one room of a burning building. Meanwhile, five strangers are trapped in another room. You see the point? The, the, the idea that is often a part of this theory is you have to be impartial to adjudicate this. And I'm just going to shoot real straight with you. If there's a building burning down, and my wife's in it. I hope you got somebody coming to get you. <laughs> I'm going after her. I'll, I'll go ahead and admit, I, I'm partial. You know, we've kind of gotten to know each other a little bit over these 20 whatever years. <laughs> I'm a little bit partial. And that's why some go, it just seems a little bit cold and calculated and, and is asking you to do something that, in fact, you probably can't do. That you probably can't do. Right? Okay. Well, yeah, I, the, the scenarios that I put you in, like I said, everything that I talked about tonight was, I mean, the trolley problem was made up, but the other stuff was real, you know, and, and that's why when you're looking at people that are in those situations, you go, man, that's, that's, that's a tough place to be because you're making real decisions with real consequences. And all of us, by the way, agreed, we do value consequences. I think everybody was saying, yeah, 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 we do. But again, and as we end, that's just not everything that there is to morality. There's more. We're just not there yet. We'll get there next time. We, we place different values on different consequences? Or you say we no. What I was saying was that we don't, what we don't say or what we were not saying in here is that all that there is to morality is the consequences. Make sense? We, 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 we factor them in, but by no means is that all that there is to this. Yeah. All right. Was that helpful at all? Good, because I'm done. <laughs> yeah. What was the actual judgment on our Do what? <laughs> well, if you remember, one turned, turned state's witness and the other two got... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Guilty. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were guilty. All right. Uh, hey, friends, I'm going to pray our way out. Hopefully tonight was of good use. We got, we got a little bit more theory to go. I, I give a lot of scenarios to you. Hopefully it helps you kind of see what we're talking about better. Uh, but once we lay the foundation, again, the reason I'm doing, doing this is in, in broad strokes. Like, but the reason I'm doing it is, I want, again, I want you to be able to hear where somebody is coming from. Right? I want you to hear where they're coming from. I want you to hear the kind of reasoning that is there. And I also want you to see their, their benefit. There were benefits to utilitarianism. I didn't say there weren't. But there are also drawbacks to it. And I want you to be able to kind of like listen and process 
where somebody is going with somewhere, because when we get into applied issues, everybody's coming from somewhere. There's an ethical theory that is the foundation of how they got there. And so if you don't know what it is, you don't know how to, you know how to deal with it. So that's why we start here. So I'm going to pray our way out. I hope to see you on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock or 1030. Bring a friend. We'd love to have them. I'm going to pray. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for every person here and for tonight, hopefully of good use. We have, we have a lot to think about over the course of this fall with each other, and we want it to be beneficial uh, to us, to the, to the world that we're living in. I, I pray it would help us to be the salt and light that you've told us to be. I pray that you would help us with that. Uh, help, us, help us in this to understand where people are coming from, to be, to be good to listen and to understand, e even if we disagree, but to show that we can, we can hear where they're coming from, but also maybe to engage better and hopefully so that someone, as we do engage with them, might find Jesus. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.